look back 50 years and, and what public mental health was, uh, state hospitals were highly prevalent in closing. Individuals were institutionalized for years and sometimes as many as decades and, and did not have the opportunity to live in a community. It was a time in, of enormous uh, turmoil, a uh, civil rights movement, educational uh, stressors, the Vietnam War, you name it. Uh, and there was something that was troubling so many different segments of the population. We walked a rugged road, we faced a thousand turns. We couldn't always see around the bend. But somewhere on that path, we learned that if we fell, we'd rise again with help from a friend. We didn't know how to act. Uh, the early 60s, signed by John F. Kennedy, really launched um, a new vision for how to take care of people with mental illness. The um, National Council started shortly after. Providers that were doing the good work came together to join the National Council's membership. Over time, we've seen mental illness and addiction come out of the shadows as more and more people have opened up to talk about their struggles and their experiences and their lives in recovery. We set out to be the leader for behavioral health in this country, and I think we've achieved that. And as we go on, I hope is gone, that as we will fight and we will win. And when you feel numb, look how far we've come as a brighter day drawing near. Tell me where do we go from here? So we have this great new understanding of the importance of integrating and treating both the chronic medical illnesses and addiction and mental illnesses. But we all hear about this long lag between when great new ideas happen and when they get done. And the thing about the National Council is it takes new ideas and it makes them happen. The biggest victory for our community in the past two years in terms of public policy advocacy is the fight to preserve Medicaid. We st stood up and said loudly and clearly, this is important, we need to do this. We're engaged in this idea that these things aren't separate and that we want to speak with one voice when we talk about both addiction and mental health you know, and the power of recovery. You need continuity of care for very sick people. I don't care whether you have a bad leg that needs to be fixed or whether it's your head or your heart you need to work on it. And it's generally better to have different points of views as to how to approach it. The perils that we face right now are whether these things will be funded into the future and whether or not we'll get to take this to a new level. The bottom line is we know more now and we can't unknow this stuff. And as a result of that, we need to do things differently. We've built a head of steam, we learned a thing or two. We've shared and we have overcome. We see a better road, we'll never walk alone. We'll travel on and step with the drum. And as we go on, our hope is strong that when we join hands, we'll come through. Cause when we unite, there's a path that's right And we're closer to it every year So where do we go from here? When I think about what healthcare can look like in 10 years, 20, 50 years from now, it looks like healthcare is everything. It is behavioral health. It is physical health. It is addressing the social determinants of health. We've got to be vital. We've got to show how many diseases and illnesses have a strong behavioral health component. We need to keep spreading the message of recovery. Um, we need to keep bringing the consumer voices to the forefront of the policy debate. Um, we need to keep sharing stories um, with policymakers. You guys are the choir, and, and really, we want you to, you know, to go out into the world and sing as loudly as you can. And as we go on, 
our hope is strong and it's all that moves us along. The thing that energizes most of us to do this work is hope. We believe that everyone we serve can recover, but we also have to look at more effective ways to, to make that happen. And I think there's exciting things in front of us we haven't even imagined. Try to see the day when we all can say that we all have made the vision clear. Only together, working together and covering the gamut from all different sectors of our behavioral health care industry, can we push for a society where one who, no matter where you work, no matter where you live, you have people who support you and support your mental health. And together we can make that happen. Oh, where do we go from here? Yeah. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Nashville and to NatCon 19, Healthcare's Behavioral Health Conference. Please welcome your President and CEO of the National Council for Behavioral Health, Linda Rosenberg. Good morning, oh my God! Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. Welcome, of course, to Nashville and to NatCon 19. Thank you to this fabulous band that you'll be hearing from for the next few days. They're really awesome. And the great music um, that's been written specifically for you and for all of us and the people we serve. So what do you think of my boots? Pretty cool, huh? Now, I did, however, bring my heels with me. Cowboy boots are not so easy to wear. They're heavy when you walk. So I'm trying it, but if I need to, I might have to do a switch. So we've got a great show for you. Um, and where do we go from here is a question on everyone's minds these days, but it's especially on mine. For the first time in my 15 years with the National Council, it was difficult putting my thoughts into words until I found a wonderful quote from the author of Winnie the Pooh. It's true. He wrote, how lucky I am to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard. Saying goodbye is hard, but I have been oh so lucky. It's been my honor and my privilege to serve as president and CEO for 15 life-changing years. In my time with you, thank you. In my time with you this morning, my last center stage, I want to thank you for all that you have done for me, for the National Council, and most important, for people with mental illnesses and addictions. I want to honor what we've accomplished together, and I want to leave you with a few parting thoughts. Fifteen years goes by in the blink of an eye. Just think about what life was like in 2004. For one thing, we were 15 years younger. I had those pictures I had to look at. We didn't have iPhones or Twitter. I didn't binge watch TV on Netflix or Amazon Prime. There was no Uber or Airbnb or Alexa. In fact, my husband, who's with me today, says Alexa sometimes is nicer to him than I am. <laughs> Alexa, is that true? I plead the fifth. <laughs> When I began with the National Council, I had some first day of school jitters. But I quickly saw the truth in Maya Angelou's quote. I've learned that people will forget what you said. P 
People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. In my years with the National Council, you've made me feel cherished and blessed, surprised and delighted, honored and humbled. And along the way, I've had some unforgettable experiences. I'm a kid from New York City who grew up in the city housing projects. I've been treated like a queen. My first visit was to Texas in 2004. I hadn't, yes, Texas is in this house. I hadn't started yet, but I wanted to be there. They were having their annual meeting. I was very nervous, but their warmth made me feel like family. And as I listened to your issues and challenges, I knew I had walked in your shoes and that New York and Texas aren't very different after all. Not to be outdone, Pete Kenimer invited me to his center in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Never even heard of Fort Smith, Arkansas. But he arranged for the mayor to give me the key to the city. The key to the city? I hadn't won a World Series or walked on the moon, but that doesn't matter in Fort Smith, where every guest is treated like a celebrity. And I saw the spirit of the 1960s still alive in Vermont, where human rights and civil rights are part of the ethos. Woo, Vermont, go Vermont. How many beautiful places there are in this country that I never would have had the opportunity to visit. It's fitting that we're in Nashville. I have a jukebox actually in my suite, a great goodbye gift, and I've been playing all the country songs, and one of them is Johnny Cash's song, I've Been Everywhere, Man, and that's how I feel. And along the way, I've hobnobbed with first ladies. I sat in Michelle Obama's chair. I had dinner with Rosalind Carter and the honor of interviewing Hillary Clinton, three amazing, deeply committed women. I've gotten to know the first lady of song, Lady Gaga, and her wonderful mother, Cynthia, and they are the living embodiment of their work to spread kindness around the globe. I've testified before Congress on your behalf about the early deaths of people with serious mental illness before other people were talking about it. Testified about the mental health of veterans, about the opioid epidemic, and about solutions to the community crisis and the need for certified community behavioral health clinics. I've been at the White House when the bills we champion have been signed into law. Even to be in the gallery in the Congress when a vote's being taken, I had never and would never have experienced that. And to go into the offices on the Hill and hear pain from Congress people and senators about mental illnesses and addictions in their own families. All experiences I never dreamed of having, never. And you gave me all of that. We've done so much together, learning communities, improvement projects, technical assistance, all because we want to make lives better. I've learned the business side of behavioral health. I've seen that you can be for profit and still be for people, that you can be high tech and high touch. I traveled with some of you to Cuba and to Europe and saw how warm and welcoming the behavioral health stakeholder community is no matter where they live, and how we share the same battles to get effective care to people who are struggling. Even this conference has given me opportunities I never could have imagined. I've been introduced by Mickey and Minnie. <laughs> and I've danced and I've rapped, but I hope you forgot my rapping. It's not my next career. And I've been preceded by a Tina Turner impersonator and years later thanked for having the real Tina Turner on stage. <laughs> Some people question, why do we go to such great lengths to be certain you enjoy yourselves? And that's easy. 
We want you to have a world-class experience because there is nothing too good for those who do good. And do good you do. You transform lives and communities and find practical solutions to complex problems. And you improve practice where it counts and where it is hardest to do, not in the offices making policy, but in the continuous healing relationships that support recovery. We got into this business to help people and help people we have. In the past 15 years working together, we have done some amazing things. We moved integration from concept to reality. Recovery is now the expectation, not the exception. We stopped asking what's wrong with you and started asking what happened to you. We advocated for parity and we're fighting for its implementation. We advocated for full inclusion in the Affordable Care Act, and we got it. We advocated for certified community behavioral health clinics, and they are now remaking specialty services in this country. They're integrating care, delivering medication-assisted treatment, and providing crisis services. In Niagara County, New York, addiction is implicated in 70% of offenses that lead to incarceration. The CCBHC partnership they created includes a mobile unit that meets inmates at the door when they're released from jail, takes them directly to their first medication appointment. They are reducing recidivism and most importantly, changing lives. We can't celebrate, and they are not the only groups doing this. I was walking here this morning and talking with Alan Oberman. I'm giving a shout out to New Jersey, my neighboring state, who is also doing the same kind of work as are many of you. We can rightly celebrate the successes of CCBHCs while still recognizing that we don't pay for cancer treatment or my cardiac care with demonstration programs or grants and we shouldn't do so for mental illnesses or addictions. We need sustained funding and we need it today. Clinics in Oklahoma and Oregon have their funding ending at the end of this month and those in Minnesota, Missouri, Nevada, New York, New Jersey and Pennsylvania may have to close their doors in June. This means the more than 9,000 people who now receive medication-assisted treatment will lose their care. It means that clinics will sharply cut their capacity. In places where same-day access has become the norm, they'll be waitlists again. In addition, we'll lose more than 3,000 newly hired professionals, hired because we could afford to pay them. And it will decimate the gains that we've made. We can't let this happen, and I know you won't let this happen because you've been with us every step of the way. In his farewell address, President Reagan said, I've had my share of victories in Congress, but what few people noticed is that I never won anything you didn't win for me with every call you made and every letter you wrote. And those words couldn't be truer for all of you in this audience. You continue to man, demand action on CCBHCs and you've kept up the drumbeat for mental health first aid. Since the National Council introduced mental health first aid to this country in 2008, a million and a half people have been trained to save a life. Police and corrections officers, teachers and bus drivers, faith leaders and parents, and now teens. By 2020, we expect to reach 2 million trained. We are well on our goal of making mental health first aid as common as CPR, and you did it. In 2018 alone, 
that year, because of your hard work, we moved our field forward. We increased treatment funding to fight the opioid epidemic. We improved coordination of care with support for electronic health records. We successfully championed a loan repayment program for addiction treatment specialists, and we helped chip away at the IMD. But we have to ask ourselves, yes, you did great work, but it's not done, because we have to ask ourselves, who have we left behind? Startling figures show that the average life expectancy in the United States dropped for the third straight year, driven by increases in overdose deaths and suicides. We are now more likely in this country to die from an opioid overdose than from a car accident. Partisan divide persists over the Accountable Care Act. The administration wants to end the protected status of mental health drugs. And the president budget renews the threat of block granting Medicaid, punishing the oldest, the sickest, and the poorest. So where do we go from here? How do we ensure effective, respectful health care for all people including those with mental illnesses and addictions. At the National Council, we start by being passionately curious. Best-selling author Adam Bryant, who's been a speaker at past conferences, says, passionately curious leaders are deeply engaged with the world. They go into new situations trying to figure out how things work, and then how they can be made to work better. The most effective leaders, Brian says, have a bias toward action. They are fearless, but not reckless. I urge you, as I leave you, to be the kind of leaders who have a bias to action, who are deeply engaged with the world, and who continue, as you have done, to make things better. How can we make things better for people with addictions? At the National Council, staff traveled to Europe and to Canada just last month to visit supervised injection sites and see harm reduction at work. Here at NatCon, right near registration, you can walk through Safe Shape, a traveling exhibit, to see what a typical site looks like. If we are truly committed to battling addictions, then it's time for us to understand harm reduction as a path forward. How can we make things better for people who are having suicidal thoughts? Jeff Swanson, a member of the National Council's Medical Directors Institute, makes it clear. Suicide is a public health problem that dwarfs the homicide problem in this country. Consider this. Preventing mass shootings would have saved approximately 500 lives between the year 2000 and the year 2016. Preventing gun suicides would have saved 319,000 people during the same period. Easy access to guns is a key reason why suicide deaths continue to climb in this country. And preventing suicide is something that even the most ardent supporters of the Second Amendment can agree with. When you are deeply engaged with the world and have a bias towards action, you have to ask the right questions. Start by questioning unintended consequences. We wanted to be part of health care. And we are. We wanted to decrease stigma, and we have. Now demand for mental health and addiction services far outstrips supply, and it will take years to catch up to that demand. We wanted to be paid for value, and we will be. But most community organizations don't have the financial resources to take on significant risk. And when they've tried selling services to insurers and health plans and doctors, you know, companies, they met with very limited success. But if you're a community agency, 
What's the danger? Can't you continue on as you are? I don't think so. The investor-run companies entering the marketplace will pursue full-risk contracts. They'll negotiate bundled rates, capitations, and case rates. And they'll negotiate directly with the heads of insurance companies. They all run in the same circles. Today, you're going to hear from a giant in this brave new world of healthcare. Atul Gawande is a surgeon, best-selling author, and he's also the CEO of Haven, the new joint company founded by Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan. Talk about a powerhouse. Haven will focus on improving access, lowering prescription costs, and making insurance benefits understandable to all of us. Good luck. We will be relentless, Atul says. But you know what? You can also be relentless. I've seen you do it almost every day. And we're learning to operate in this transactional economy, creating networks across communities and even states, forming IPAs, and skillfully advocating for the most viable alternative CCBHCs, Prospective payment is how our member FQHCs have not only survived, but thrived. It's long past time for there to be parity in the safety net. It's also long past time for us to be able to recruit and retain a skilled workforce. Your biggest problem, I know. With unemployment at a 49-year low, the current labor shortage affects all industries and all employers. But we have some unique issues. Current reimbursement rates depend on a large supply of inexpensive, or if I was going to be crass, I would say cheap labor. And there is increasing demand for that inexpensive labor. The Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts that we will need one million more direct care workers in five years, by 2024. This means that we need rates that cover competitive salaries. And we need new models to recruit, to speed up onboarding, and to support staff. Are we ready? Yes, we do. Are we ready for these challenges? New players enter the marketplace while existing organizations must manage extensive culture change. It's a lot easier to start fresh than to change a culture that's 50 years or more old. Behavioral health executives need to make decisions and respond quickly to changing markets. They need digital dexterity. That means using data for strategy and change and using technology to re-engineer processes and relationships with staff and patients. This requires leaders schooled in business, not just psychiatry or, like me, social work. A bias towards action demands that we step up to the bold new world of responsiveness and convenience. If you're mired in the way we've always done things, you will falter. Challenge time-based assumptions. Eliminate patient waiting, friction, and cumbersome forms and procedures. The National Council has been preaching same-day access for 10 years because it works and its time is now. <laughs> Being a passionately curious, fearless leader demands that we question beliefs, even when doing so makes us uncomfortable. Social determinants of health, such fancy words. Look, the poor die 13 years before those who are not poor. Doesn't that tell us that being poor is bad for your health? And doesn't that mean we need government policies that pave pathways out of poverty. Consumer, consumer versus patient, 
don't the words matter less than how we're treated? What's wrong with being called a patient if you're treated with intelligence and respect? Trauma competent, culturally competent, military competent, all important, but don't we need care that's clinically competent? Shouldn't we begin with teaching the basic skills of making connections, establishing relationships, and delivering effective treatments? Conference speaker Dr. Sally Sattel isn't afraid to challenge widely accepted beliefs. Conventional wisdom says that addiction is a disease like any other. Is it? We hear that addiction doesn't discriminate, but it does. Instead of narrowing our thinking about addiction, Sally seeks to widen it. She highlights the comforting fictions we tell ourselves. Conference speaker Anand Gardadas isn't afraid to question philanthropy, and we have philanthropy in the audience. In his best-selling book, Winners Take All, he takes us into the inner sanctums of a very new gilded age, where the rich and powerful fight for equality and justice, except in ways that threaten the social order and their position atop it. At the National Council, we too question conventional wisdom. We challenge the widely held belief that stigma is the major barrier to care. Stigma and discrimination are real, but do we need yet another anti-stigma campaign? When every day we get calls from people looking for care, who are telling us that getting care is their real barrier to getting well. White, middle-aged, working people can't find anyone to take their insurance. Young children of color are suspended and expelled instead of treated. And families of people with serious mental illnesses face a tangled web of services, each with its own admission criteria, rules of engagement, and revolving door of staff. And policymakers have said, you can't run multiple programs. That's not consumer choice. Well, guess what? I like to go one place, have my mammography, see my cardiologist, and get my prescription. <laughs> access, access is the biggest barrier to a healthier America. And at the National Council, we've dedicated ourselves to solving that problem. In my 15 years with the National Council, I've tried to be the kind of leader who has a bias toward action, who's been deeply engaged with the world, and who's always trying to make things better. Passionately curious, but not reckless. And I've been able to do that because I've had the honor and privilege of working with some of the most fearless leaders in the business, starting with our board of directors. Betty Funk, a past chair, led the search committee when I was hired and talk about fearless. She was a legend. She recently reminded me of the middle of a night fire drill during a board meeting when both of us dressed completely, including makeup and heels, to go down seven flights of stairs and to see the rest of the board in their PJs. Betty, if you're here and not in your PJs, would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> the best interview of my life, of course. Let's give also a round of applause to our current board, led by the indomitable Jeff Richardson. He's been fearless in supporting us through a CEO transition. And I know he will be invaluable to our new president and CEO. I've also had the best executive leadership team in the business. 10 outstanding executives who put the collective impact of the National Council before their self-interest. They are not all here, but I want to name them and I want them to know how very, very much they mean to me. Joe Parks, Sola King, Rebecca Farley-David, Mohini Venkatesh, 
Tom Hill, Joy Burwell, Betsy Schwartz, Bruce Palou, my beloved work partner, Jeannie Campbell. This conference is a testament to her skills. Chuck Ingolia, a leader who will bring passion, intellect, and flawless execution to the role of president and CEO. Please give them a hand. This, this exceptional executive team will continue to lead the National Council, supported by an amazing staff. From a staff of 12, we've grown to 140 strong. From a budget of $2 million, we've become a $54 million organization. You'll see many of our talented and friendly staff here today ready to serve you, wearing their trademark national blue scarves and ties. Please give them a very warm hand. <laughs> While I'm handing out thanks, I can't forget the most important people in my world. My wonderful sons and daughter-in-law, Matthew, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Joshua, a skilled plastic surgeon, and Corrine, a talented speech pathologist whose warmth embraces our family. They've given me the greatest gifts of all, five amazing grandchildren. And thank you. And thank you to the most important person of all, my husband of 50 years, Bob. Yes, yes, for you doing the math, we did marry in kindergarten. <laughs> he has loved me and supported me with his wise counsel and kept me laughing. I love and thank you. 15 years goes by in the blink of an eye. In those 15 years, I've seen the National Council become a force to be reckoned with. We've passed legislation, we've changed practice, we've saved lives. All the while, we've been kind to one another. We've shared our challenges and successes, all of us here. We've given a leg up and a hand outstretched. So where do we go from here? And where do I go from here? So as I step down from the National Council, I'm not setting down the mantle you so gracefully bestowed on me. This work is too important to me, to the people we serve and I care about, and to this nation. I'll continue the fight for effective, respectful care for all people with mental illnesses and addictions. In her final comments as First Lady, Michelle Obama told us, be focused, be determined, lead by example with hope, never fear, and know that I will be with you, rooting for you, and working to support you for the rest of my life. As I enter my next chapter, know that I will be with you, rooting for you, and working alongside of you for the rest of my life. It will be my honor and my privilege to do so. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome National Council member John Santopietro. As a leader in behavioral health, I think of myself as built by the National Council. I finished training as a psychiatrist in 2000. I wanted to save the world one person at a time as a clinician. But my first job was in an inner city hospital and I was immediately afflicted when I saw that the behavioral health system was broken. I knew from then on I had to do everything I could to try to make things better. This meant stepping forward early as a leader. I stepped forward to take on challenges, 
to try to make a difference and to leave a system better maybe than I got it, all the while moving on to bigger and bigger systems. After a few of these cycles and perhaps 10 years into these leadership roles, without any formal training in leadership, I stumbled into the National Council's Psychiatric Leadership Development Program. That chance encounter changed the course of my professional life. I must have had a premonition at the time about the impact the National Council would make on my career. You could tell maybe by the way I held on just a little too tight to Linda when she came by that first leadership dinner and gave out hugs. Luckily, Linda, poised as you know her to be, went with it. And the rest is history, or at least my history. Linda has been a huge influence on how I've shaped my career. It's pretty cool to go through the stages with someone like her, from idol to mentor to friend. And by the way, she's still an idol. What was it that made such a difference in that early exposure to the National Council for me? I was connected to a world filled with people that have the same passion about making our behavioral health system better, to make it better serve those it's supposed to. I cherish the relationships I've developed both within and facilitated by the National Council. Those relationships sustain me to this day. We are poised right now in an incredible moment in healthcare in the United States. We spend more money on healthcare, 3.4, 3.5 trillion dollars, than France's GDP. The healthcare market has woken up to some inconvenient truths, like the fact that we're not keeping people healthy, or outcomes are just not what they need to be, but it's also woken up to at least one, I think, convenient truth. The fact that investment in behavioral health makes a huge difference in outcomes. Now more than ever, we need to be at the table. We need to be there as the infrastructure is built that's going to drive healthcare over the next couple of decades. We behavioral health leaders need to be at the table because systems will be built with or without us. And we need to make sure that these delivery structures are built with what I call clinical soul. What do I mean by that? Well, it's a little hard to define, but you know it when you see it, like soul music or a soul mate. Just look around you here in this room. There is wisdom right here that has developed over so many years across so many geographies to provide client-centered, team-based, recovery-oriented, trauma-informed care that strives to delight our clients while helping them achieve their goals. I know I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for the National Council. I'd be still out there floundering around for solutions, disconnected and on my own. The National Council is a national treasure. It's a source of energy, a sun that warms and nourishes thousands and thousands of passionate clinicians, leaders, and visionaries. I've been able to grow in its light, and I'm so invigorated as I watch others grow in its light. Each year, I look forward to doing everything I can to help the National Council continue to expand its work and its reach. Lives, quite frankly, depend on it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome someone who looks and sounds remarkably like Johnny Cash. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. Well, you heard his tale and he said his mind how he didn't know much. What he'd find is a powerful yarn, and I'm sure that you'll agree That the judge's words would be a pity And since we're in the music city This story might be better told by me You game? You bet! 
Well, as he said, he became a shrink, got a big degree, and he started to think. A dream to change the world began to dawn. So he packed his bags, his passion swirled, and he set on out to heal the world. But I tell you, it wasn't easy for this man named John. No! No, it wasn't! Because he learned real quick to swim upstream. That reality didn't quite match my dream. That bitter realization left to see. So he made a vow to himself and you that whichever place fate took him to. The only way to fix it was to leave. <laughs> so a superhero cape in hand, he set on out to leave the land. Barely any training to lead on. And he wandered into San Antonio, feeling kind of scared, a little alone. But he said to the place, My name is John. What's going on? Yeah, that's what he told him. Well, he soon found a mentor and a guide and sidled up to lend a side. Maybe even scared her with his vim. But she took this man to third wing and counted and taught him everything. Before you knew it, leaders looked to him. So the lesson of this country too is like he had Linda and I got you. Whether you're at home or at NAPCOM, you're never far from the help you need if you want ideas or to learn to lead. But don't trust me. Take it from this other guy named John. Yeah!